Wait, it got rid of the presenter view though. And I did that. Presenter view? Yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, we need you again. Hello, hola, aho, aya, owa, hoa, han. My name is Lawton Blanchard, and I am an undergraduate research fellow, and I will be sharing the current late acknowledgement for Tyson Research Center. Located in what is now known as West St. Louis County, Missouri, Tyson Research Center operates at the intersection of research and education in the ecological and environmental sciences, sustainability, and environmentalism. Before Tyson, the land was stewarded by indigenous people. However, land ownership was not a concept free contact. Therefore, many peoples have called this region home across time and even at the same time for different reasons. Despite the differences in how and when they came to call St. Louis home, many tribes have claims to this land. Although we may never know the full extent of indigenous peoples whose ancestral lands include Tyson, we will take time to acknowledge those we do know. First, that the Giazlin, descendants of the Cahokia mountain builders, who is split into five groups, the Ka, Oaxa, Omaha, Ponca, and Wazashe, who you may know as the Kansa, Kwapa, Omaha, Ponca, and Osage, or Osage, respectively. The Kahahia, meaning he scrapes it off by means of a tool, who you may know as the Kaskaskia, the Kikapu, meaning he stands and moves about, who you may know as the Kikapu, the Dakota, Nakota, and Nakota, of the Ocheti Shakoin Oyate, meaning the Council of Seven Fires, who you may know as the Sioux. And finally, the Nuachi, meaning people of the river mouth, who you may know as the Missouri people. Despite the differences in cultures, languages, and types of this land between each of these groups, they all suffered genocide, by war, disease, and cultural destruction through colonization, and all were forcibly removed to reservations from this land. We make this acknowledgement because Tyson is committed to becoming an anti-racist environmental field station and to making science more diverse, equitable, accessible, and inclusive. We start with calling these tribes by their names, uplifting their voices and contributions to science and including them in planning for the future. It is therefore vital to acknowledge the ongoing history of colonization and white supremacy, which this station is built upon to begin the work of healing, reconciliation, and justice. However, acknowledging the indigenous history of this land is just a starting point to giving witness to the lives of these people and their impact upon this region. Therefore, we strongly encourage visiting our website, Tyson, T-Y-S-O-N dot Wustl, W-U-S-T-L dot E-D-U and exploring the About tab. There you will find resources about the indigenous history of this land, as well as Tyson's commitment to social justice. We call for the entire Tyson community to work together as we learn and grow and hold ourselves accountable to this mission. Thank you. Well, it's the first time I've heard that. Thanks, Lawton. Um, as I gather myself, um, I will quickly tell you um, that we have this fabulous owl machine for those of you who have not attended uh, in person yet. Um, it follows, it will track you as you speak if you're asking questions. But I would ask that during uh, the presentation, you try and keep it quiet so it doesn't veer off of our wonderful speaker today and um, focus on what it is going on the track. Okay. Uh, so I am absolutely honored to introduce our speaker today, Dr. David Desmond, um, who is currently um, located at the University of California, California Riverside. And today he's delivering our own sex and seminar. Um, he graduated from WashU, um, graduate degree is here, right? And is currently, uh, as I just said, is in the Department of Biology at UC Riverside. Well, at WashU, he worked closely with our former director, extraordinaire, Owen Sexton, 
which is why he's ordering a similar day in memory. Um, much of David's work investigates uh, the process of evolution using experiments performed on natural populations. He developed a wonderful system using methods of Trinidad, uh, which has grown into a, a pretty enormous research endeavor, which I'm certain we will be discussing today. With the system, he established that there are differences in life cycle like phenotypes, guppies, with different information risks, but these differences have a genetic basis and using um, very well developed field experiments demonstrated that these evolutionary changes can happen rapidly, and much more so than previously assumed with evolutionary processes. Since then, many of the investigators have followed suit to uh, provide a pretty large um, group of literature um, showing the rapid adaptation and rapid processes can occur in a small time. David's work, he's been very prolific. Uh, his papers have been cited more than 28,000 times. Uh, he has received more than $13 million in grants to support his work. And while I failed to get all of his accolades written down here to articulate to you, I encourage you to go to, to his profile and see Riverside, some of the wonderful awards that he has received. His most recent being the prestigious Humboldt Fellowship in Germany. David is going to talk today about the struggle, struggle for existence. And because he's delivering an Owen Sexton seminar, he will lead into that um, how Owen and experiences with Owen and uh, So please join me in welcoming Dr. David. Yeah, it's a very great honor to be here in, in, the, in the name of, of a memorial lecture for, for Owen. Um, which way does this go? Press it down. Hmm? Yeah. Oh, come on. I should have brought my own. This is not responsible. Point, oh, point it at the laptop. Okay. It is. It's not responding. It's not responding, Beth. <laughs> Sorry. There. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, this is one section for Unmute everyone. Right hmm? right Thank you for reminding me. That's something I always would forget. Okay, I'm on. I'm ready to go. Okay. Um, what I'll be talking about today is, first of all, the conceptual approach to science that I got as a consequence of working with Owen Sexton. I'll then talk about the work that I actually did with him initially, and then I'll talk about how I continued with that theme in my own work that followed. The Struggle for Existence is chapter three of The Origin of Species. The first two chapters of The Origin of Species were about variation under domestication and variation in nature. And that's where Darwin established that organisms are highly variable, they're individual variations, and that many of these are faithfully transmitted from parent to offspring. What Darwin did in chapter three was, for the first time in the book, talk about how and why evolution by natural selection occurs. He began with reference to an essay by Thomas Malthus written in the late 1700s. And Malthus in that essay was concerned about human population growth and the fact that human populations showed the capacity to increase to the point where their ability to sustain a good standard of life would be threatened. But Darwin's take home message from that was different. What Darwin took home was that all organisms, including organisms that have development as slow as humans and produce as few offspring as humans, have the capacity to increase in population size exponentially, but they don't. Now, the question, you know, what Darwin was, was very much of an empirical person, and the idea that you could increase exponentially was something that you could figure out with arithmetic. But for Darwin, this was also something that he experienced during the voyage of the Beagle, because while he was on that voyage, 
He saw plants and animals from Europe that had been introduced to South America or Tahiti or to Australia, and that when they got there, their capacity to increase in population size exponentially was realized. Here he's talking about what he called the cardoon, we'd call it a thistle. And what he's saying here, highlighted in red, was that he saw places in Patagonia where the thistle was almost like a monotypic stand of plants that covered hundreds of square miles so densely that they were impenetrable. And the point was that he saw that under some circumstances, this ability for populations to increase exponentially was realized. And it begs the question, why doesn't this always happen? Why are organisms generally regulated so that their populations do not increase exponentially? And the question then is what regulates abundance? Darwin's idea was that when these organisms were transplanted to new places, that whatever it was that was regulating their abundance, they were released from and they were able to realize their capacity to increase in population size. And it wasn't a climatic thing, because often the climates were the same. What he argued was that the main regulators were antagonistic interactions among organisms. The key antagonism being predation, another being competition, either competition among individuals within a species or competition between species, or perhaps we could talk about competition for space. But Darwin also recognized that the ecological interactions could be much more complicated than that. So for example, he was interested in bees pollinating flowers. In fact, the first book that he wrote after The Origin of Species was about how bees pollinated orchids. And that's a mutualism, that's not an antagonistic interaction. But he also recognized that the abundance of bees in any place was often controlled by mice because mice would attack bees nests and eat all the larvae. And so they could reduce the bee abundance. But then the abundance of mice could be controlled by cats because cats eat mice. And he speculated that if we were near a town where many people had pet cats, that the abundance of flowering plants would be different from what it would be if you're out in the countryside where cats were absent. The main point is that he saw this process of regulation as being one that involved complex, multi-trophic ecological interactions. So what are the consequences of populations being regulated? He was arguing that the regulators of abundance are selective and that they shape evolution. There's a difference between those that survive and those that die. And the ones that survive, survive because of individual variations that, for example, make them better competitors or make them less susceptible to be eaten by predators or make them more successful as predators. But that the idea is that death is selective and that over time, the regulation of populations is also going to cause the average attributes of the population to change because of the differences among phenotypes and survival, which is what we call evolution. But what he also was saying is that what dominates in shaping how organisms evolve is biotic interactions, it's interactions between organisms that shapes evolution. And he's very explicit in saying that he doesn't think the environment is very important, the physical environment. We often think of, of temperature or water availability or altitude as things that will shape evolution. And he said, yeah, those things may matter, but in fact, he thinks they're of secondary importance and that biotic interactions are the dominant interactions that shape how organisms evolve and adapt to their environments. Okay, so that's a conceptual framework. And now I'll talk about how I arrived at that conceptual framework. I'll talk about my college days and how I ended up at Washington University. Before I applied to college, I really was interested in ecology and evolution. I didn't really know what evolution was, but I really did think about what it was. I knew the word and I knew it was something that interested me. And I got there through my interest in natural history. I was particularly interested in reptiles and amphibians. I grew up going to the Northeastern US for the summers as a teenager. I went to the Southwest and spent weeks at a time camping and traveling throughout the four corner states where I got to you know, fulfill my desire to see rattlesnakes. But it also meant that I got to see the same animal in very different places and different environments and appreciate that they weren't all the same. And it was something I started to think about. As a college applicant, I sent a letter to the application uh, department and 
ask questions about what they had to offer at Washington University in the way of ecology and evolution. And I got a handwritten response from the chair of the biology department, whose name is easy to remember. His name was Johns Hopkins, I think the fourth. And he told me about what they had to offer. And in particular, he told me about Owen Sexton. So shortly after I arrived here, I went and knocked on Dr. Sexton's door. I said, I was interested in ecology. I'd like to take courses by him. And he always looked at me skeptically. I mean, I always got this sense that I was bothering him. Um, and he said, you know, go away, take some courses for a year. We'll see how you do and then come back. And so I took courses for a year. And at the end of my freshman year, I came back and, and he gave me that same skeptical look. And he said, well, you still have some general science courses to take. You shouldn't take my class. There's only one of them. You should wait until you're you know, a junior or a senior, go away. Um, so I came back at the end of the second year and bothered him again. And at that point, I think it was easier for him to give me something to do than to keep telling me to go away. And so he gave me a small project to work on the summer after my sophomore year. And then in my junior year, I continued with a different project. And then I asked him to become my honors thesis advisor. The irony is at that point, I was also interested in applying to veterinary school. And the demands for just having an application accepted at veterinary school were such that it dominated all the courses that I could take. And I never ended up taking a course from Dr. Sexton. I instead just knew him through this independent research. And it was only later that I wondered if all this constant skepticism that I saw when I was coming in and knocking on his office door might have something to do with the way I looked. And perhaps my appearance was offensive to him. I really don't know. Um, by the way, I don't know any of these people. This is actually an album cover from the late 1960s. Um, <laughs> Okay, this slide represents what I've learned from Dr. Sexton. When it came time for an honor thesis, he handled, handed me an NSF proposal. And I can't remember if it was one that he had submitted and had been rejected or it was one that he did not decide to submit, but it was one that, that never had money from the NSF. A previous student had worked on it and, um, and he thought that there's more to be done and that I might find something of interest there. I read the proposal and then I decided I was going to read every single paper that was cited in the proposal so I could understand the conceptual framework of, of what it was all about. And there's great stuff there. There's stuff about predators and predator search image formation. The idea that predators that fed on different kinds of prey could actually have a template in their brain for what kind of prey they wanted to find, but that would improve their odds of finding them. I also learned about models that you could have prey that were toxic and dangerous to predators and that some of those prey might become brightly colored they might have warning coloration and there are others that might mimic them but i can remember they actually gave us a key to the library and i remember wandering the library stacks late at night finding a book with an enig enigmatic chapter about mimicry by a guy named ronald fisher and i thought this is strange and never suspected that oh no this is somebody i would hear a lot about when I went on to graduate school, because the name meant nothing to me at the time. But here, this is sort of one example of the things that I learned. What I really learned was about a discipline that you could be titled ecological genetics or evolutionary ecology. But what you're looking at here on the right-hand side of the slide are butterflies from a family that feed on plants that are poisonous, and they sequester those poisons in their bodies. And in that way become distasteful and dangerous to predators. And the idea is that their warning coloration means that they're easy to see and it's easier for predators to learn to avoid them. I've seen these animals now I'm doing my field work and they fly around in the bright light in the middle of the day and they're, they're hard to miss. These butterflies are actually not poisonous. They're highly edible, but they look just like the ones that are poisonous. And so these are referred to as models and these are referred to as mimics. But it's worth thinking about what actually lies behind the details of this slide. And it actually begins with plants. Plants are fed on by herbivores and many plants defend themselves by producing toxic compounds. I've been told that if you went out into the forest and decided I'm gonna live off the land, by eating plants and you didn't know what you were doing, that you'd be dead within a week because so many plants that are out there are so poisonous. So that's the first step. The second step is that some of the things that eat plants evolve the capacity to resist those poisons. 
If you can do that, even if it's costly, you have a resource that most other insects can't exploit. So you have your own, your own kitchen, so to speak. But then some of those also evolve the capacity to take those poisons and sequester them in different parts of the body and turn it to their own defense. Some of those in turn evolve bright coloration. And now we're getting into the interaction at the next trophic level, which are the things that are eating them. And the idea is that by being brightly colored, by having warning coloration, they have the capacity to train things to avoid them more readily than if they were not brightly colored and not easily recognized. And then some of undefended insects will exploit that avoidance on the part of predators by evolving to mimic the, the appearance of the models. So this is like Darwin's cats and mice and bees and flowers in a different version. It's talking about evolution in a complex multi-trophic interactive system. And, and that was the sort of thing that I learned to appreciate in the time that I spent reading through his literature cited. This is what I actually worked on. This is the what, what he proposed. The lizard is one that's found in Costa Rica. He had done life history work on that lizard with a, a graduate student named Ken Marion. Um, and what he was interested in was the interactions between that lizard and this insect. This insect is one that lives on milkweeds. It's a local one, it's toxic. And a prior student had done an experiment where she had baby lizards. These lizards are live bearers. And so he had some of them shipped from Costa Rica. They gave birth to live young. And the student looked at their first encounter with prey and she gave them a cricket versus one of these bugs. And the lizard always went for the cricket. When I was confronted with, with this, I decided to do something a little fancier because a cricket and the bug differ in many different ways. And I wanted to be more specific. And so one thing that I did was to take these bugs. I was doing pilot studies. I had lizards that I'd collected the summer before in Arizona. And I present them with one bug like this and one, one bug that had been blackened with charcoal, which Owen Sexton had recommended to me. And that was fine. But it turns out also that these the signal from these animals goes way beyond color. They have a specific shape, they have a specific way of walking, and they have a strong odor. And so when confronted with a black versus a black and orange one, they were also confronted with common traits that the two shared. And so I made another type of insect. I took a beetle that I knew the lizards liked to eat, and then I'd paint the beetle completely with a coat of orange, and then I would give it either a partial or a complete coat of black. And in doing so, I also would glue the elytra together so they couldn't fly out of my enclosure by, because that's what they did when I first did my first trials. Uh, but the point was then, now they were presented with another pair of prey that only differed in their color, but in the background, they were prey that they, they would eat, and that, that, that they liked, and didn't have other signals that are associated with prey that a lizard might avoid and that might be toxic. The other thing I did was to look at different age groups. I had newborn baby lizards that were encountering prey for the very first time. And so it was sort of a test of their brains and asking if there was a preconceived notion of what was a good thing to eat or an innate avoidance of things that should be avoided. Uh, but then I also looked at lizards that were two to three weeks old and had been feeding and looked at ones that were about seven to eight weeks old and looked at wild caught adults. And so I had two types of prey, each with paired comparisons in four different age groups. And in the results, I got a lot of, 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 of interesting results. I have to backtrack a little bit and say that in fall quarter, as I was preparing this or fall semester, I went into his office and he said, oh, by the way, the guy who was going to send me the lizards, he can't send them to me. Maybe we'll come up with a different project, or maybe you could go to Costa Rica and collect them yourself. And I was like, you know, I'm going to Costa Rica. You know, that's, that's, there's, no, there's no alternative there. And I didn't get much advice from him when I went to Costa Rica, except for the recommendation of a good restaurant that turned out to be in Panama. Um, <laughs> now, I needed, I needed lots of advice, and I met some very helpful people when I was in Costa Rica. So I was able to go and collect the lizards, and everything worked out well, but not, not before I had some adventures along the way. But I was going to say that I did these experiments. I got lots of good results. Um, but there's one result that was leaning in the right direction and not significant. It's one that I found very compelling. And the question was whether or not newborn lizards that were seeing prey for the first time innately avoided brightly colored prey. And so that was one of my eight treatment groups. That was 
new two to three day old lizards that were confronted with beetles that were either solid black or black and orange. And, and the early data said that they were more likely to attack the one that was solid black. And I wanted to know, did they really have that? Was it really the case that they were neurologically hardwired to avoid something that was brightly colored, something that might be dangerous? And so in my first year of graduate school, I decided I'm gonna go out and I'm gonna collect more of these lizards and I'm gonna increase my sample size to see if this trend is sustained. And if in a larger sample size, it becomes significant. And at that point, I'd had some statistical training and I knew how many more lizards I would need to test to attain a significant result. Um, and I knew how many babies a lizard of a given size would have. And so when I went to the field, I didn't want to be wasteful and bring back too many lizards more than I needed. So I caught enough lizards, I estimated how many babies they would have um, to give me the result that I, you know, to ask whether or not there really was a significant preference. And, and after increasing the sample size for that one of the eight treatments, I got the result that 44 first chose black and 29 first chose orange. And it was leaning in the right direction, but there's something weird, which is that I had fewer lizards in the second year than I expected based upon all of my great preparations. So when I did the statistic, it was like, you know, what you're looking for in statistics, we arbitrarily say that it has to be less than one chance in 20, less than 0.05 would be consistent. It could have been closer without missing. And so the question is, why were my best laid plans? Why didn't they work out? Why did I, I have all my homework of how many babies a lizard of a given size would have and how many babies I should expect from the ones that I brought back to, to produce? Um, and so I went and took a closer look at the data. I had enough statistical training that I knew how to do something called an analysis of covariance now. On the x-axis is the size of the mother lizard. On the y-axis is the number of babies she had. And much to my disappointment, although it explained why I fell short, the lizards that I caught in 1975 were having fewer babies than the lizards in 1974. Who knows why? Something had changed between the two years. Their fecundity declined. And as a consequence of that, I fell short on what I had planned to do. Now, what you have to do now is fast forward 10 years. Now it's 1985. I'm a first year assistant professor at the University of California, and I'm working incredibly hard teaching for the first time. My first teaching assignment was a course in vertebrate anatomy. I had never had a course in vertebrate anatomy. I was having a very hard time keeping ahead of the class. I wasn't always succeeding. I lost eight pounds that semester. And I knew that I'm also expected to publish and I didn't have a prayer of publishing anything. There just wasn't enough time. And then I got the idea that I had a three day weekend coming up in the early winter. I was gonna go into my lab early on Monday morning, my day off, and I was gonna write a paper that one day. And I remembered this result that I had stuck in a file folder somewhere. And I went in and spent the whole day. I wrote it up. I submitted it. I got it published. It's not that big a deal. It was a note in the Journal of Herpetology, but it, it enhanced my sense of self-esteem. Um, and, and that was it. You know, the, the, the take home lesson to you is sometimes your very best plans that, that you lay out and that seem watertight don't always work out. But in this case, they didn't work out for a reason. If you really knew what you were doing and somehow things went awry, that there's a reason why they didn't work. And in this case, the reason became a product that I could, could later exploit. And what I'll be talking about now is what I went on to, how I, I took the, the conceptual framework that I got from the work that I did as an undergraduate and went forward with it into graduate school and then into my future career. And the title of that is Predation's Manifold Effects on the, the Evolution of Prey. Okay, the goal that I set for myself as a graduate student was that I wanted to test some aspect of the theory of evolution in a natural setting with an experiment. And I chose the theory of life history evolution as the conceptual framework for doing that work. And the reason I chose that theory is because it made predictions. If you're gonna test predictions, you have to have a prediction to test. And so this idea gave me a prediction that I could test. But the question is, what do I mean by life history evolution? What you need to do is to think of your life as being like a pie. And that pie is divided up into four different slices. One slice is maintenance. That's the 
way you use the resources that you consume to replace all the parts of your body that are constantly wearing out. For us, parts that are in constant need of replacement are things like our skin or the lining of our intestinal tract or our blood cells. Those are all things that wear out on the time scale of, of days to weeks. Other parts of your body are wearing out as well. Okay, so maintenance turns out to be a big slice of your, your pie of life. Another slice is growth. There's probably no one in this room who's still growing or very few of us, but earlier when you were 12 or 13 or 14 and you were growing, you, remember, you may remember that you could eat anything in sight and you weren't gonna gain any weight because it was requiring so much energy to sustain growth. A third slice of the pie is storage. You may not think of something like fat as being adaptive, but for most of we're trying to get, most of us are trying to lose it, right? But most of animals in the real world for fat, it is adaptive. Fat is a way of taking resources at a time when they're abundant and establishing a savings account for times when they're not abundant. So for example, in the past few months, we had whales that were migrating along the west coast of the US. They took shelter in bays on the coast of Mexico, gave birth, stayed there, nursed their offspring through the first few months of life and did all of that without eating anything at all. And that's the most expensive part of a mammal's life cycle. Lactation is much more expensive than pregnancy. And the reason they could do it is because they had these enormous storage stores of, of resources that were established at a different time in their life cycle when food was abundant. Then the fourth slice of the pie is, is reproduction, the actual making of, of babies. Now what life history theory predicts is the best way to divide up the pie of life into these four different slices so that it maximizes the number of offspring that you contribute to the next generation. The idea of the pie is important because the pie is finite. And what that means is that if you make any one of these slices bigger, you're making another slice smaller, meaning that there's gonna be a trade-off between putting more into one function and less into another. A sample prediction from life history theory is that animals that live in environments where they experience a high death rate will also experience selection for those individuals that begin to make babies earlier in life and that devote more resources to making babies at any one point in time. Now, the idea is that starting when you're younger and putting more into reproduction means taking that slice of pie that's associated with reproduction and making it bigger. And you can't make that slice bigger without making the slice that's associated with growth or maintenance or reproduction smaller, which means that you're borrowing from your future in some way but if you're in an environment where your future is limited because there are other factors out there that are limiting your lifespan, then you may never live to pay the price of investing more in reproduction now. So that's a sample prediction. The animals that I work on are guppies. And what you're looking at here are two male guppies and three female guppies pictured in their natural environment in Trinidad. Guppies are an ideal animal for laboratory work for a couple of reasons. One is that they're small and you can keep a lot of them in a small space. An adult male guppy is about 15 millimeters long. An adult female guppy is about 20 to 25 millimeters long. A second reason is that they're fast. The time interval between when a female guppy is born and when she first gives birth to a litter of young can be as short as 10 weeks. And that's a nice thing. You have the combination of lots of guppies in a small space and short generation time. The third reason is that the guppies are live bearers. The babies are like miniature adults and you can rear them in the same way as you would adults. And the probability of survival from birth to adulthood in a laboratory setting is about 100%. Fish that are egg layers produce young that are very small, fragile, hard to keep, have a much higher probability of dying before they mature. And if that's true, if you only can get 10 or 20% of them to maturity, then it means that those that you have to work on may be a non-random subset of the population as a whole, whereas with guppies, they all survive. And it means that if you have a certain genetic diversity of fish that you collect in nature, you can retain that diversity very easily in the laboratory. Now, guppies are a good animal for field work um, in part because of where they live. The guppies that I work on are from the Northern Range Mountains of Trinidad. This is a seasonal tropical rainforest that gets on the order of three to five meters of rain per year and it's well supplied with rivers that run throughout the year. 
To think about the kind of habitat that I'm talking about, you have to appreciate the spatial scale. I described Trinidad as being like a toy wilderness. And I'm gonna be talking about fish that live downstream in big rivers versus upstream in headwater tributaries. If we were in Missouri, you'd be talking about places that might be 10 or, or hundreds of miles apart at different elevations and in very different environments. When you're in Trinidad, this is a big river. A little headwater tributary is something that you can step over, and the distances between the two can be on the order of a half a mile. They're close to each other in the environment. The physical environments are, are very much the same. So it's a different setting from what you would be thinking about locally. What I'm interested in in Trinidad is the differences among the types of communities that guppies are found in. Guppies can be found, I've sort of dichotomized this and it simplifies things a little bit, but I'm also selective in where I do my work to try to deal with the simpler set of circumstances. But what I do is to contrast guppies from what I refer to as high versus low predation communities. The high predation communities tend to be downstream localities in the bigger rivers and more species of fish there. The upstream communities are low predation communities where guppies may co-occur with only a single species of fish. Okay, these three species of fish are typical of what you would see in a high predation community. And they're all very well equipped for eating guppies. This one's equipped for hurting you if you're not careful with them. This is the only fish that's found in the low predation communities that I concentrate on. These animals are usually about three to six centimeters long. They have a small terminal mouth. When they eat guppies, they tend to eat just small immature size classes of guppies, and they mostly eat insects. Okay, the first question I ask is how do guppies evolve in response to living in these two different types of communities? Okay, what you're looking at here is a schematic of the northern part of Trinidad. The northern range mountains run on an east-west axis. And then you have a series of rivers that are draining the south slope of the northern range and others that are, are draining the north slope of the northern range. This is just off there. It is. Okay. Then ones that are draining the north slope. High predation is coded as either in red or yellow, and low predation in either blue or green. The point is that all of these rivers are running roughly parallel to one another, and all of them present us with the contrast between high and low predation. We know using genetic tools that each river represents an independent in instance in which guppies from a high predation community have invaded and adapted to low predation communities. And so you can think of the Northern Range Mountains as being like a naturally replicated experiment where guppies have adapted to these alternative environments. This is not working now, what have I done? Oh, I wanna come here. No, that's not working. Okay. I'll do that. Okay, another important feature of these streams is that very it's a steep gradient and they're very often punctuated by waterfalls. And at some of these waterfalls, you can find guppies in a high predation environment down here below the waterfall, and guppies in a low predation environment above the waterfall, meaning that the waterfall is the upstream barrier to the distribution of the high predation guppies. And when you see this kind of setting, it means that you can compare guppies from high and low predation communities that are found only tens of meters apart in environments that are identical to one another, save for the presence or absence of predators. And it turns out that I can find differences that are as pronounced on that spatial scale as I do when I see guppies that are downstream versus in headwater tributaries. And when you see that, it's a much stronger argument that it's predators that are causing the difference as opposed to something that's correlated with predators. Okay, the other thing you can do with guppies and that I do regularly is I'll go to the field, I'll collect adult female guppies, bring them back to the laboratory and put them in one per aquarium and take advantage of a handy feature of guppy reproductive biology, which is that once they mature, they reproduce continuously and they store sperm. And so each adult female that's in a tank by herself will produce a series of litters of babies that then become another pedigree in future experiments. And I can do multi-generation experiments where I can ask if the 
differences that I see in life histories of wild caught guppies are genetic differences. They're ones that will persist in a common environment, which are which are heritable. Okay, I then can do experiments in which I can treat rivers as if they were giant test tubes. And one type of experiment that I did is, is represented right here, where I have guppies living with predators below a barrier waterfall. And above the barrier waterfall, I have a guppy free stretch of stream with only one species of fish, the fish that's typical of a low predation environment. So I can take guppies from the high predation environment, extend their range over the barrier waterfall into the low predation environment, and in that way, reduce their risk of mortality and ask how do they adapt to those new settings. And I can ask about their evolution by using the ancestral population downstream as a control. Okay, this is a summary of what I learned. What I, what I, or the summary of the evidence that I have. I have natural replicates of high and low predation localities from nature, so I can do comparative studies. I can do laboratory genetics, and I can ask whether or not the differences that I see in nature are genetic differences. And then I can look at experimental evolution with these introduction experiments. And this is what I found, which is that guppies from high predation environments, meaning ones that we presume suffer a high mortality rate, mature when they're younger, they reproduce more often, and they devote more resources to each litter of young. And all these differences are the ones that are predicted by life history theory to evolve in response to having a low probability of survival in adulthood. In other words, to, serve, to sustaining a higher, uh, a higher mortality rate. Okay, here's just a sample of what the data looked like. And so I have low predation versus high predation guppies, and we're looking at number of offspring on the y-axis. And then I've looked at north versus south slope populations in low and high predation. Each one of these points represents five to six populations. And these numbers are adjusted for the size of the mother. They're equal, equal mother sizes. But the point is that the high predation guppies are producing two to three times more babies in each litter of young as the low predation guppies. And those differences are quite consistent and they're not small or subtle. Here I'm looking at offspring size, and what I'm showing here is that the high, high, the low predation guppies are producing babies that are about 50 to 60 percent larger than the guppies from high predation environments. So these are very large differences, and they are consistent differences. I also found that the high predation guppies make babies more frequently. So they begin when they're younger, they reproduce more often, so they increase reproductive effort by timing, but then they also put more resources into each litter of offspring. Okay, this is a cartoon just to help you remember what the differences are. And the cartoon is primarized on real data, but you have the high predation guppies are small with many small offspring, and the low predation guppies are large with few large offspring. So you can burn that into your brain to remember for future, the, the rest of the talk. Okay, in terms of experimental evolution, I showed that these same patterns evolve in the introduction experiments, um, but I also could show the rate at which they evolve. This kind of setting meant that I could talk about, make estimates of the intensity of natural selection, and also to uh, talk about the rate of evolution. And the answer is that the rate was really fast. If you compared the rate that we were seeing in this, these experiments with what people were inferring from the fossil record, it was giving us numbers that were 10,000 to 10 million times faster than people thought really represented evolution when we looked at the rate of evolution that, that you would infer from the fossil record. So it was, it was very fast. Okay, people, either, either I or other investigators have looked at the evolution of other things, other things that change in response to predators. And so we talked about life histories and body size, but we also see the evolution of male coloration. We see the evolution of behavior and that behavior includes things like social behavior. High predation guppies aggregate more and they're more social because that's part of their protective measure. It's like a flocking bird than our low predation guppies. Um, but they also are more attentive to the danger posed by predators and they have different types of courtship. They differ in neuromuscular performance. The high predation guppies are faster and that higher speed is even present in the grandchildren reared in a common laboratory environment. And we can show that that higher speed significantly increases their probability of survival of an attack by the predator. We show that they have differences in body shape. 
again, that those are heritable and things that will persist and they have something they contribute to the differences in performance, plus differences in almost anything else that we logically predicted might be influenced by predation. And they include diet, gut length, basal metabolic rate, and spill morphology, which influences um, the kind of things that they are able to, to eat. Okay, this all leaves me with the idea that, yeah, guppies do evolve in response to predation, but it turns out that it also is open to alternative hypotheses. One hypothesis is that the reason they evolved is because of differences among localities and size and age selective predation. And the idea is that high predation causes increased adult mortality. And you can think of that as being a direct effect of predators. But an alternative is predator-mediated density dependence. The idea is that low predation results in higher survivorship. And there is a hint from very early field work that guppies in low predation environments were present at higher population densities. And that the differences in life histories that we see and in other traits that we see are a consequence of an adaptation to differences in density, which you can think of as being an indirect effect of predators. I articulated these alternatives in the very first paper that I published about uh, life history evolution in guppies. Okay, the trick is that the same outcomes can, the same, the two alternative hypotheses can yield the same sort of life history evolution. So you can't look at what the guppy is like and tell the difference between why the guppy may have evolved. And so that brings the next question, which is why do guppy life histories evolve? And is it a consequence of the direct effect of predators or the indirect effect of predators, which is their impact on density? and whether or not density is what's, what's influencing the evolution. Okay, the first new technique that I developed as in part to answer these questions was to become a guppy tattoo artist. We developed ways of individually marking guppies by giving them small subcutaneous injections of different colored markers. The material that we use is made from an elastomer that was developed for human surgical implants, and so it's hypoallergenic. And then a company called Northwest Marine Technologies adds color to it and sells it to us for fantastic prices. My original motive for doing this is that when I presented this work, I would say there are these differences in fish communities and somebody would raise their hand and say, well, what about the birds? What about the invertebrates? How do you know there really are differences in mortality? And I decided that, okay, I, I can't answer that. So I'm just gonna go out and measure mortality. By, by doing individual based mark recapture, you can find out what mortality rates are in nature. And here's my first result. What you're looking at here is probability of survival. And then these are different size classes of guppies. But this is the probability of survival of guppies from high predation versus low predation localities. So this was actually a large scale experiment that was replicated, I think, eight different times. And it was over a short time interval. But in fact, you can show that guppies from high predation environments have much lower probabilities of survival from one time to the next. So the mortality rate is higher. There's actually another detail of this result, which is more ominous, but I, I won't talk about that now. I'll tell you about it later if you're, if you're interested. In the same context, I could look at the comparative ecology of guppies from high versus low predation environments. And what you're looking at here is we had different ways of looking at population density. And what this is showing you is that in low predation environments, the population density was in fact more than between four and five times greater than it was at high predation environments. We had different ways of looking at it, numbers of fish, biomass of fish, other things, and, and they all gave pretty much the same result. Here we're looking at the size distribution of guppies. And what you can find is that guppies from high predation environments are guppies that have high mortality rates and high birth rates. And so most of the fish in that environment are young, small fish, and a much smaller proportion are older, larger fish. Whereas in the low predation environment, the size distribution is much more uniform. They have a lower birth rate and they also have a lower death rate. Here you're looking at the growth rates of guppies in high versus low predation environments. So what we find is that the guppies from the high predation environments are in fact growing a lot faster than are their counterparts from low predation environments. So this isn't because of differences in temperature or any other feature of the physical environment that we could measure. Um, it just suggests that there's more, that more food per individual. Okay, so this is an indication of indirect effects of predators. The predators kill guppies, but predators also reduce population density, 
they alter age and size structure, and they potentially increase per capita resource availability. Conversely, when you take predators out of the system, the guppies become more abundant and per capita resource availability declines. Okay, so then the next question is, are guppies really density regulated? The idea is that in low predation environments and higher population densities, we should see that those populations are density regulated. And so we did experiments in streams that have what we refer to as a pool ripple structure. So in the foreground here is a pool, and then upstream from the pool and downstream from the pool is a steeper gradient where the water is flowing quickly in a straight line. So the water empties into a pool, and then the pool has a lot of turbulence, and then the water drains from the pool. And the stream has sort of a staircase structure where you have pool, ripple, pool, ripple, pool. Guppies like to aggregate in pools. They're disinclined to swim from one pool to the other. And I discovered early along that I could catch every single guppy in a pool in a fairly brief period of time. And so the experiments that we did involved taking three pools, collecting every single guppy, marking them individually so we knew who they were and how big they were at the beginning, and then reintroducing them at manipulated densities. And the idea is that if you're density regulated and you reduce the density, then there should be changes in the population that suggest the population will grow. So you would get a higher individual growth rate or a lower death rate or a higher birth rate. If you increase the population density, you should get the opposite, changes that suggest that the population will decline. And that's exactly what we found, that we found that when we manipulated density, we altered growth rate and birth rate and mortality rate in a way that suggested that at a reduced density will increase and at a higher density will decrease, which says that at the ambient density, these populations are density regulated. So in the absence of predators, their density can matter. We then did experiments to look for density dependent evolution. And to do that, we built a series of artificial streams. At this point, I had ecosystems ecologists as collaborators, and we could show that these artificial streams were good replicates of natural streams, because there's a natural stream right behind this one, and all the invertebrates, what they do is they fly out of the stream, fly around and find places to lay eggs, and they lay the eggs in our artificial streams. So you could have guppy populations in there and have fairly stable, um, fairly stable ecosystems. Then we had a, a spring up here, and we channeled water from that spring to a, a reservoir, and from the reservoir, we gravity fed it through our artificial streams, and then the water flowed back into the natural stream. And so it was a way of just diverting a little bit of natural stream flow. But then we did experiments where we had guppies from high and low predation environments, reared at high and low population densities. We could parameterize these. We'd done the comparative ecology. So we knew what a normal density would be like and what the size distribution should be like. Um, we also could show how the guppies performed and that the growth rate and mortality rate and everything that came out was within what you would see in a natural stream. And so everything was, was fine. And what we found was that, in fact, guppies did show evidence of density dependent evolution because at low population densities, guppies from high predation environments have much higher fitness than did guppies from low predation environments. At high population densities, they lost that advantage. And if killifish were present, then the low predation guppies, in fact, had higher fitness. And so you could see evidence of, of adaptation to the, to, to the alternative environment. So that's density dependent evolution. Um, this is just a slide. And you know, the question is can you really show that guppies change their ecosystem? Because that's part of what you're saying when you have density dependent evolution. What you're looking at here is a, a rectangle made of copper tubing. And this rectangle is just sitting on the bottom of the stream. This is a identical rectangle, but it's attached to a fence line charger that puts a weak electric pulse through the coil every second. And what that coil, what that pulse does is it repels guppies, but none of the invertebrates because guppies are bigger and they're more influenced by the electric field. And so we can show that the invertebrates cross that barrier well, but guppies do not. And so what you're looking at here and the difference between the two is a visualization of the impact of guppies on their ecosystem. Guppies are constantly grooming and feeding on the bottom and they're clearing the substrate of, of sediment that might otherwise form there. If you take guppies out of the picture, the layer of sediment accumulates very quickly and that becomes the substrate for the growth of this golden brown carpet of single-celled algae, diatoms that, that cluster on the surface. And what we could show is that 
you know, this is a measure that guppies really do something. And to me, this was stunning because deep down inside, I didn't think they did. I thought guppies were like an ornament on their ecosystem and, and we weren't going to find anything, but logic says we should look for it. And we did. And, and it was a, like I said, a, a stunningly dramatic result. What we showed was that guppies in low predation environments then are density regulated, that they've adapted to high population densities. And we've shown that they change their ecosystem. All guppies deplete the, the environment of algae and invertebrates, um, even at, at normal population densities. Okay, now I'll talk about what I'm doing currently. Um, what we've done is take everything that we've learned and we put it together on a much larger scale in a template that will enable us to expand the kinds of questions that we can answer for this system. And I have collaborators. Ron is a former graduate student with me. He's now our principal investigator. Tim Coulson is a, a theoretical ecologist and population biologist from Oxford. And Joe Travis is a longtime colleague. We met my, his when he was a senior undergraduate and I was a first year graduate student at the University of Pennsylvania. And we've worked together ever since. But what we've done is a new set of introduction experiments that's embellished greatly over the ones that we did before. We found four tributaries to the Guanapo River that all shared the property of having a barrier waterfall at the base that excluded all fish except for the killifish. What we then did was, and all these streams had another barrier waterfall upstream. So we could define an introduction site, a site where when guppies were introduced, they would be confined to. And the length of those introduction sites varied from 60 to about 180 meters, depending on which replicate we're talking about. We then looked at the ecosystem of the introduction site and what would become the upstream control and characterized it for a full year. We also did mark recapture on the killifish for a full year. Then we introduced guppies and continued with that discipline. And in addition, we started doing mark recapture on the guppy populations. The founder population, the guppies that were introduced, all came from a single high predation locality further downstream. We had already characterized what those fish were like. We knew what their life histories were. We knew that they were typical of a high predation locality. We also had looked at their genetics. We knew that they had a lot of genetic variation uh, for, for certain, certain types of, of genes, which we would need for, for the future. We then instituted a guppy mark recapture. We, the guppies were introduced at low population densities. Every introduced guppy was individually marked. We kept scales from every introduced guppy to serve as a source of DNA. We intensively census every locality every month. Every new recruit, meaning every fish that's unmarked, meaning that it was born and grew to be big enough to mark, received an individual mark. We kept scales from them. We photographed all of them. And from the photographs, we can collect a diversity of data. And in the time being, we're also continuing to look at the ecosystem and the killifish that they're co-occurring with. The only way we're able to keep up with this work is that we have an intern program. And I'm showing this slide because some of you might be interested in our intern program. We hire interns for a period of three months. We pay for their travel. We cover all their expenses in the field. We give them travel insurance and we pay them a stipend. And while they're there, they learn how to do large scale research, how to work with the team. And we also have packages to show them how to analyze the data and they can participate in other experiments. If some of you think you might be interested, you might check out the intern program further on our, our website. Okay, one of the things that we could do here was to enhance our test of the alternative hypotheses for why guppies evolve in low predation environments. If the, if the guppies evolution is a consequence of the direct effect of predators, then evolution should begin as soon as the guppies are introduced to that new environment, because it's when they're introduced to the new environment that their probability of mortality declines. And in fact, that's when the, the strength of selection should be the strongest. If guppy evolution is caused by indirect effects of predators, such as guppy population density, then there will be a time lag between when the guppies are introduced and when they begin to experience density dependent selection. And there are things that we can do with our data to actually evaluate when they begin to experience density dependent selection. Okay, so one hypothesis says it should begin immediately. One says that there should be a time lag. 
These are what the results look like. We started one pair of screens in, in 2007, the second pair of screens in 2008. What we found is that there's a time lag of two to three years between when guppies were introduced and when we see the evolution of male age and size of maturity. It happens that male age and size of maturity is the most rapidly evolving feature of the life history. So it's one that we looked at first. We looked at all the others also, but this one had not changed significant, or the others had not changed significantly, which was also true of the earlier introduction experiments. There are other alternative hypotheses for getting this result. We found out, you find out when you try to get papers published that people have other ideas about the ones that you propose and will challenge you. And so it took us three tries to finally get this paper accepted and a great deal of refinement in how we evaluated the results. But in the end, we were able to sustain that interpretation of our data. So in conclusion, the weight of evidence from diverse sources which include comparative ecology experiments and artificial streams and introduction experiments, favors the indirect effects of predators as having been the cause of guppy life history evolution. And the fact is that for most of my career, I said it the other way around. I thought it was the direct effect of predators and age specific risks to mortality that were causing them to evolve. And I was wrong, but I did at least pose that alternative from the very beginning. Okay, this slide is meant to tell you that the results that I'm talking about are not just guppy-centric results. What you're looking at here is the Yellowstone National Park in 1990 when wolves have been absent for about 90 years. And this is the Yellowstone National Park after about 2010, after wolves have been reintroduced. And the question is, why does the place look so different? And the answer is that when wolves were absent, elk were abundant. And when elk were abundant, they stripped the environment of the plants that they preferred to eat. And as a consequence of that activity, they also changed the structure of the insect community and the structure of the bird community. When wolves were reintroduced, elves became rare. When elves became, uh, elk became rare, not elves. When elk became rare, the plants that they preferred to eat were, you know, came back and the insect community and the bird community changed. Some people argue that time, you, you know, we changed, we, reverse the clock of time and return to what it had been. And I don't think that's really accurate. But the point is that what you're looking at here is something that's referred to as a trophic cascade or the influence of a keystone species. This is an ecological phenomenon that's been well described and well studied in ecosystems, both aquatic and terrestrial throughout the world. And, and it's a different way of saying that very often you see circumstances in which key species and their abundance in the environment is a function of other species being present or absent, and it can have cascading effects on the whole structure of the ecosystem. The ecological aspect of that kind of phenomena are very well known and well studied. What's virtually never been considered is what the evolutionary consequences might be. And so in this regard, you can think of guppies as being a model for thinking about this phenomenon that's so common and widespread and what evolution might be contributing to the different endpoints that you see in the presence or absence of, of a keystone species. Okay, there are projects in the pipeline. Joe Travis is looking at the advent of mechanisms of density regulation in the four focal streams. We can actually prove that it took two to three years for density regulation to begin, which explains the time lag. But it turns out that just showing density regulation is not the whole story. There has to be a specific mechanism of density regulation to match theory with what we saw. And what he shows in this work is that that mechanism of density regulation is in fact the one that's operational. It has to be that density regulation is by recruitment, birth rate or, or juvenile survival and not by adult survival. And, and we can prove that that's the case. This is obvious. I think it needs no explanation. But um, what you're looking at here is the pedigree. We have the DNA, right? And so for each individual, we can get genetic data. And one of the things that we can do with it is identify who each individual's mother and father is. But then we can also go on and talk about what each individual in the population attains in the way of lifetime reproductive success, which is one way of measuring fitness. And then we can ask, what are the differences between individuals that have high lifetime reproductive success and those that have low lifetime reproductive success and, and learn something about evolution in a different way? We usually look at evolution as a change in the mean attributes over time, 
what we're showing here is we can look at evolution as individual attributes that influence how successful that individual is in contributing offspring to the next generation. One of the results that we've gotten from that so far is to show negative frequency dependent selection on male color patterns. We can follow Y chromosome trajectories through eight generations in this one population. And we can show that every generation of males that shares a Y chromosome looks just alike, that the color pattern of the males is a Y-linked supergene. But then we also can show that all of the original Y-linked supergenes are being maintained in the population, which if you model populations, that shouldn't be happening. You should be losing them over time. And the reason they're maintained is because that when they become rare, they have an advantage. Females prefer to mate with rare males. And those females that mate with rare males have more grandchildren because their sons are also rare. But then by the time of the next generation, that Y chromosome pattern has become more common and the advantage is lost. And so you get this constant cycling that maintains genetic variation in the natural population. And that's a completed manuscript that we're getting ready to introduce. What I haven't told you is that killifish are evolving in response to guppies. So there's much more going on in the way of evolution. And the way, the nature of the ecological interaction between guppies and killifish is such that they shouldn't coexist. It's inconsistent with sort of old fashioned theory of coexistence, uh, but there are new types of theories of coexistence that can accommodate the sorts of complexity that we've seen. That complexity is that they have different age groups and each age group is ecologically distinct from the others, but it's also that each of them are predators on the other. The adults of both species eat the juveniles of the other species, plus the adults are competing with each other. And that kind of complexity challenges the usual ideas about what it takes for species to coexist. And so our money for the past couple of grant cycles has been to look at coexistence theory and, and, and more modern versions of coexistence theory. But that's some of the work that we've been publishing lately. Uh, part of that has also been to look at how utilization of resources changes when the animals come in, the killifish and the guppy come into contact and they're adapting to each other. We're using something called stable isotopes to do that. Now we can look at the genetics of adaptation. We have our first study showing in the four replicate populations that all four of them carry a signal of, ev of evolution at the level of, an in of individual genes on the same chromosome. It's in chromosome 15 and that's our first you know, step into looking at the genetic basis of, of adaptation. Okay, so the take home messages, the big ones are that evolution is observable in real time and that incorporating contemporary evolution and ecology can improve our understanding of natural systems. And we've been able to do that in a variety of ways. And that the integration of experimental evolution, comparative studies and field experiments can characterize ultimate causes. And that's the end. They didn't come out well. They came out unexpected. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. So what what's predicted is that a corollary of the evolution of earlier maturity and higher rates of reproduction and investment is that those animals should age more quickly. That they're taking away from their future. And so we did a large scale experiment in the lab that took over four years to complete. I'll never do it again. Um, and, and the result was the opposite of what you would predict, that the guppies from high predation localities in a laboratory setting had a lower, aging is an acceleration of death rate with age. Um, you know, so everything's gonna die, but the question is how does, how, how does the probability of dying increase with age? And, and so, you know, if you've watched your parents and grandparents that, you know, the probability increases as they, you know, clear 70 or 80 or whatever. Um, and the guppies, the rate of increase was higher for, high, for low predation guppies and high predation guppies. Furthermore, the high predation guppies continue to reproduce to a, a more advanced age. 
and the rate of decline in reproductive performance was slower. And so, you know, for me, it was like watching a nightmare unfold. I knew by two years which way it was going and, and watched it develop for four years. And, and, and so, I mean, to say that it's not necessarily, you know, disappointing result, it was a result that challenged some of the traditional ideas on the evolution of aging. I think probably the other thing it was, was a, a challenge to how we measure aging, because it turns out that I was measuring it on fish reared one per aquarium, getting quantified amounts of food. And the kinds of things that we've seen here is that these animals live in very different contexts. So there's a confounding between life history and things like density and resource availability. And, and, um, and that, if, and it's actually difficult to include those things in an experimental setting. But my sense is that if we did it again, that we could show that there's actually an interaction and that if we reared them in high population densities, it would, it would flip that, that outcome. We actually have, I, I think I know of ways that you can do that. Um, but, four, but- Four years? Hmm? Another four years? Yeah, well, you can do it less time than that, but it would take at least a year. Um, I was really fascinated by that copper tubing experiment that kept the the duckies out. Um, did that have only that effect? I mean that that uh, detritus difference was quite phenomenal. Um, when you say did it have that only that effect? Well, I could imagine it attracting other things. Oh yeah, I mean the, the communities yeah. that were within, I don't know if you saw, but we had those tiles and, and what the tile was a quadrat that you could pull out at regular periods of time and then you could fully analyze it without messing up the rest of what was in there. <laughs> and so the invertebrate communities were different and we were able to look at how they were different. Um, so what we, were, what we learned is that the, the high predation guppies were feeding selectively on high quality invertebrate prey. Um, you know, they're actually out picking. And that's what you see when you look at the, the skull morphology that's consistent with that. And that the low predation guppies are like a vacuum cleaner. They're just sort of sweeping through the environment and scooping everything up in proportion to its abundance. Um, and, and so we could see the influences of that by looking at the difference between where guppies were and where they're excluded from. Then we also looked at the stomach contents of the guppies. The, the electric current banks didn't have any other effects on the community. I'm not sure that I can answer that. What are you thinking? When... Uh, electric current there, it's going to have on lots of things it might attract some things. I just I don't know. Yeah. I haven't heard that technique before. At this point I've heard most techniques. I'm not, yeah. Um I mean one of the things that we did is we were like evaluating the effects of nocturnal and diurnal consumers. And so we had ones where the current was on um all the time or just during the day or just during the night. I'm not sure how you could look selectively at, at the, the effects of, I know what you're saying. No guppies there at all, and you just have the copper thing without the current at lift. And so if you got a difference if there were no guppies in the area. Oh we did oh we, we did have that. In other words we had um we had the treatment of of streams of artificial streams with no guppies. And but I'm talking about with the current yeah, no, but but in other words, if you have the artificial stream with no guppies and one with a current and one without a current, um, then then the point is that they're both the same. In other words, if the only cause of what you saw in that slide was the exclusion of guppies, then if you do it in a channel without guppies, there should be no differences. And we did that. Um, and I don't remember what we found. Okay, I think that answers your question, though, because it, in other words, if if the electric alone was doing it, yeah. and you look at with and without the electric, without any guppies present, then you should still see an effect. And I, I don't think we did, um, you know, because I know that we had that as one of one of our experimental treatments. Yeah, Bruce is 
here because he works on election leaders. <laughs> oh. Um, I understand you have that one experiment though, like four years, like how many generations of guppies? Oh, those were just one, those were individual guppies. In other words, what we wanted to do is to reconstruct to have an individual guppy and begin them all when they were 25 days old and to reconstruct what, what the individual variation was in probability of, of dying pre unit time and also in their reproductive schedule. And so we, we had the complete lifetime high of life for 240 fish from um, two high predation and two low predation localities. And so it's, it's all one generation. Yeah. So I was wondering, you mentioned you were talking about life history theory, uh, and you mentioned that the life history of organisms changes throughout their life cycle. Um, and so I was wondering if you did any work or had plans to do any work examining how predation affects these guppies differently based on uh, their life history. So whether or not they're a juvenile, whether or not they're of reproductive age, if they're past reproductive age, um, or if that's kind of not really applicable for these guppies specifically. In the sense we got that, you were you saw it, you saw the one slide where I had the four different size classes on the x-axis. You know, the, those size classes were chosen to represent juveniles versus uh, there are two juvenile size classes, and there's a size class that was mature males and females reproducing for the first time, and then size class that represented females only producing second and subsequent litters. And so it was separating them out by different size groups and um, and that was the ominous result because what you should have seen was an interaction that they should have been crossing or, or not parallel. In fact, is they were dead parallel to each other. So it's saying that the added mortality risk was the same regardless of who you were. And, and, um, and the reason that's ominous is that life history theory without density regulation says that there will be no life history evolution in that setting. That you have to have heterogeneity among age classes in order for life history to evolve. So here I am, I knew they had evolved. I mean, at that point, I'd already done the introduction experiments and everything. And then I get the result that says, oh no, they can't, they're not going to evolve. You know? and, and then if you look at the density, when you add in density regulation, um, then in fact it becomes possible for, for them to evolve to predict that. But it ha the only way it can happen is if density regulation is age specific. So that was the last result by Joe Travis, where he showed we found that yes, they're densely regulated, and the reason they're regulated, and we knew it because we had four replicates and we were, we were looking at it in enough detail, was because of recruitment. It was because of either the rate which babies were being born or the rate which babies were surviving to be big enough to be born. And so that combination of the uniform difference in mortality, which is to answer your first question, with uh, Age and size specific differences in density regulation predicts what they do. So I answered more than you asked. <laughs> well, I think it's getting late, and I have a question. I have a question from Jonathan, also from on YouTube. In the slide you showed at the end showing individual reproductive success, are you able to quantify, quantify reproductive success of offspring? I would think overlapping generations would make that difficult. Uh, no, I mean, we, we, we quite literally can identify every parent and every offspring, regardless of overlapping generations. We can follow each individual through their genetic contribution and know how many of their offspring survive. What we're actually measuring is not how many offspring, but rather how many offspring survive to be at least 14 millimeters long. So that we can capture them and mark them. Uh, but yeah, you can do that with over lots of generations. Makes no difference. Um, quantifying, you know, doing quantitative estimates of things like coefficients of selection with overlapping generations is a different story and with fluctuating density. I mean, to actually use those data is a different story and, and it's hard. Uh, but actually saying how many babies, lifetime reproductive success is straightforward. Let's thank you.